chapter three, chapter one. Let's go back to one. First Peter, chapter one, verses six through nine. First Peter, chapter one, verses six through nine. When you find it, say, "Man." Let's read that together. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation, that the trying of your faith be much more precious than of gold, that perish, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom have it not seen, ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believe in, ye rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Catch somebody by the hand and look at him and say, neighbor, you can make it through this. Amen. Say it again. So neighbor, you can make it through this. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have discovered over the years that every person works better with encouragement. Even things respond better when you encourage them. I've been a part-time dog trainer for quite some time. Whenever they do anything while training them, if you stop to encourage them, every now and then give them a dog biscuit, they'll do it again. Saints need encouraging. I'm talking to somebody in this house now. If it was not for discouragement, you would hear nothing at all. But every now and then, you need to have somebody, either through word, or through song, or through reading, or through meditation, to hear a word of encouragement. You can function better if every now and then someone tell you to hang on. If every now and then someone say to you, you can handle this. Every now and then if someone would just stop by and tell you it's not as bad as you think. Because Satan made you in discourage men. Whatever he can do to dampen your spirit, to weaken your pilgrimage, he will do it. If he cannot get you by day, he slip upon you by night. If he don't get you by phone, he will come through the television. If it's not newspaper, it's a magazine. Somehow he get his message across to try to hinder, to stop, to damage you on your spiritual pilgrimage. I've also discovered that the Lord somehow put holy helpful hints in the Bible to tell us what to expect in life. 
Too many of us get in this Christian family expecting it to be a bed of roses. But can I tell you, it's not. I mean, when you read certain passages in the Bible, it tells you then to expect serious problems. For instance, Ephesians chapter 6, listen at it as it speaks to you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wives of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principality. He said, listen at what he says to us. We wrestle, meaning that it's not going to be easy. And just the fact that Jesus says to us to make it through this, you need faith. Just the idea of saying you got to have faith indicate that it is not an easy task. That the Christian journey is a struggling journey. I know that does not sound right because we've heard so many other things about it, but struggles are good for us. I hear people making justice and statements saying, I came up on the rough side of the mountain. But have you ever tried to climb a smooth mountain? Smooth mountains is difficult to climb, but the rough side is the things that you get your grip hooked on. You have places to breathe if the mountain is rough. I said at the earlier service, by me being who I am growing up in the rural, I have the advantage of most of you because I love animals and I study animals. My daddy was a lover of them and there are a lot of lessons I learned from outdoor life and outdoor living. Even Jesus himself spent most of his time outdoors. If you notice in the teaching of Jesus, he always talked about sheep. He, he talked about sowing seeds. He talked about thorns. He talked about rose bushes. He, he spent his time dealing with agricultural metaphors. My daddy said to us when I was very young, he said, you don't have to listen to the weatherman to tell if it's going to be a rough winter. Son, he said, watch the hair on your dogs. He said, any time the dog's hair gets thick, that's an indication it's going to be a rough winter. Because God takes care of nature to the extent that he gives nature an extra covering to help them stay warm in the winter. Sure enough, whenever the dogs would get extra hair, we had to get extra wood. God give us pre-warning as to what's going to happen. If you go to the zoo, if you can ever catch one, a giraffe, that's that great big fella with the long neck. Whenever a giraffe get ready to give birth to a baby, he, he, he's not the kind of creature that lay down and give birth. She give birth while standing on her four legs. She stand 10 feet tall if you get close enough. After a while, as you get ready to give birth, you see the two front legs come out, then the head. Then all of a sudden, the whole baby body of the giraffe falls out and fall 10 feet down on the ground and land every time on his back. And when it lay on his back after the mother has given birth to it, the mother uh, giraffe look back and see the baby lying there in slime. She's covered with afterbirth trying to get from under the afterbirth and all of a sudden the mother giraffe straightened herself up and kicked the baby giraffe. 
flip him over. And if the baby does not get up, she back up and kick him again. If he does not get up, she backs up and kick him until he responds. After the baby giraffe respond from several kickings, the baby giraffe now has turned over on her feet. Little legs, she's just born. Little legs, weak, can't stand hardly on her own. And when she finally muscle up enough energy to stand, the mother giraffe position herself and kick the baby over again, send her several feet back. And when she kick her over, the baby giraffe jump back up again. Look like she gained strength from the kicks. And the reason the mother giraffe is continuing to kick the baby giraffe because she knows that predators are out there. That wild dogs, wolves, and coyotes are out there ready to get the baby and devour her. But the, the mother knows that if she give the the baby enough warning through pressure whenever other things come up against the baby she can stand on her own in other words she don't hover over her and smother her she teach her how to handle pressure a cocoon when that little thing sits sometime on trees that's how where butterflies come from scientists decided to do something special to help the butterfly be born out of the cocoon they put some kind of solution in the cocoon to make it easy for the little butterfly to come out of his shell and as the goodness it worked he came out fine after he came out had all of the color like any other butterfly, just a beautiful butterfly, beautiful color. But when the butterfly got ready to fly, it couldn't because it didn't have strength in the wings. They discovered that the butterfly got its strength through struggle. Can, can I tell you, if you don't mind, that that we get our strength through struggle. Man went out to cut trees to make light posts, posts that hold electric currents up. And he went out looking for trees to cut and he went down in a valley because it was easy to get to. And the owner, the man, the lumber man, timber man that knew something about wood said, no, 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 don't bother the trees in the valley. The man said, why? He said, because the trees in the valley has been isolated from the storm, been isolated. Here's a waltz, just sent him to heaven. Been isolated, isolated from the storm. And whenever, whenever wind come, it causes the tree to shake, to wind, to move from side to side. It gives the tree flexibility so it's stronger under the storms. But the tree that has been isolated from the storm, whenever a strong storm comes, the tree will drop a pop at its roots. Are y'all in this house? It will pop at its roots. And like so, whenever storms come in your life, if you have not been through anything, if you're not careful, you will break because you didn't grow up learning how to handle life under pressure. Anybody in this house? And so God sent us through things to help us be able to handle life even under pressure. Let me take a moment, if you got your Bible, and I want to walk through this text and let the text tailor the truth. Watch the first word. It's a wherein. Now, this word wherein is actually a preposition. It is the Greek word e-n-n. -E -N. It is neuter in its gender. It's not masculine, not feminine. It is neuter. Here is what it is saying. This, this preposition actually places us in our preposition, meaning that where I am now 
is not my final destination. It means that if you decide that you're going to judge me based upon my position now, you will miss it. Because if you try to judge me based upon where I am now, you're going to miss it because I'm just here temporarily. That there is another place that God has prepared for me. I'm just going through this now on the way to where God wants me to be. An eagle, whenever he, whenever he get ready to go fishing, you know, an eagle is the fastest bird in the air. An eagle sit out in the open and he spot a stream of water. And when he spot the stream of water, he look down and he see a Simon fish swimming down the water. And he's over a mile away from the fish, but he spots the fish. And when he leave his nest to go fishing, he aim not at where the fish is, but he aim at where the fish is going to be once he get to the destination. That's why he don't have to come and just kind of float right over the fish and wait till they get there. He aim ahead of the fish, has already targeted how fast the fish is swimming. He know where the fish is going to be by the time he get to the water. So he just fly in, dive down, and jump right back up in the matter of seconds. Got the fish, go back, sit down, and have his dinner. <laughs> Somebody ought to help me in this house. And you see, God, whenever he look at us, he don't position himself to look at us where we are. When he said, look, you can make it, he has already designated where you're going to be. You see, most of us, we get stuck at where we are now and think that I have to be on welfare all my life. That's just a temporarily resting spot. But God got something for you beyond that. You can't decide that you're going to have nothing in life. You got to know that you're going to make it in life and go after what God has for you. Somebody ought to help me in this house. I mean, I mean, the, the, you, you, you need to know that whenever you read the text that you are a special person. Let me back up and tell you again. Watch verse 2. He said, you need to know you have been elected by God. That election took place and God chose you. Now, you need to know that it was nothing on your part because you really didn't have anything to offer. <laughs> when God look at us, he see absolutely nothing. But when God look at us through the storm, he see a perfect person that's going to favor him. Come in here, somebody. He said, number one, you have been elected. He said, but let me tell you when the election took place. It didn't happen after you got right with me. He said, I chose you <clears throat> before the foundation of the world. He said, but you didn't also know that when I chose you, I knew then what I had to take you through to get you to where I wanted you to be. Let me show you in the text. I hope you got your Bible. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, watch this, if need be. Now here's what he's saying. Everybody don't need to go through what I'm going through. That's why some people look like can make it without any trouble at all. And others got to go through all kind of stuff because God see that it might take more to get me right than it does you. Secondly, whenever God sent us through things, it may be based upon what he want us to do. You see, I can never be a counselor to you if I have not experienced what you're experiencing. <laughs> Somebody ought to help me here. In other words, I guess what I'm trying to tell you, I don't want a man that ain't got no hair to try to tell me how to grow some. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna help me this out. I don't want a man walking to try to sell me no car. Come on in here, somebody. I don't, man, I don't want nobody broke going to try to tell me how to get rich. I mean, if it, if if it works, you ought to have something yourself. I mean, if the hat will work, at least you ought to have some on your head. 
if it ain't real, it ought to look like it's real. It ought to, it ought to look like, I mean, you shouldn't just be the, you shouldn't just be the president. You ought to be a client too. Somebody ought to help me in this house. And, and, and so he says in the text, he says, you need to know that there are some things that you must go through in life to get where I want you to go. Now watch the text again. It seemed like a paradox. It seemed like a contradiction because he started off saying, look, I want you to greatly rejoice. Y'all see that? He said, look, I need you to, help me say, rejoice. He said, I need you to re rejoice. Now the word rejoice in the text literally means to leap for joy. It means to kick your heels up. It means to literally dance. It means to praise God. In other words, he said, look, I want you to really just go on and throw up your hands and have a good time. But before we get through with that, he turned around. He said, because you are in a great heaviness. Now, the word heaviness, uh, are y'all in here? Uh, lupeo in the Greek literally means to weep. It, it, it actually comes from the Greek word meaning hitting the chest because you're hurting so on the inside. Now, now, how can I rejoice and yet I'm hurting on the inside? Now, I, I hear you can because I, I know some of us think that you ain't got to hurt if you're saved. Well, hear me when I tell you a low moment will occur in your life. There are some things that will hurt you that you don't find the answer in a book. You can go to all the counselors, the psychiatrists, psychologists, you can, but they can't find where the hurt is. Sometimes stuff start hurting you on the inside. You don't feel like talking to nobody. You don't want to discuss it, preach Reverend Ray, with, with nobody and look like you can't find no answer. For, I mean, you sit and folks talking, but you don't hear nothing they say. <laughs> Come on in here, somebody. You, you, you hear songs, but, but it's not relating to you. You stop at a red light that's green. <laughs> Somebody ought to help me in this house. And, and everybody else passing by and you sitting there and you wonder why they run in the light and you have not even looked up to discover it's green and whenever it turned red, then you go through it. And, and, and isn't it strange how while you're doing all that foolish stuff, God keep his arms around you that you could have been dead. I mean, a lot of things could have happened to you. God said, they don't know where they are, so I'm gonna just cover them with my love. I'm gonna wrap them up with my grace and I'm gonna make it through. And then once you get on the other side, you know what you do, you look back and say, through many dangers, toys and snares, I have already come. I mean, it was not my sense that brought me. I had to get here merely based upon grace and grace alone. Watch what he says. He said, listen, what you're going through, he said, is far a season. Now, the word season doesn't mean something like spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Not, not, no, 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 no. Oh, oh y'all not here. The, the, the word season actually means little. It come from the word meaning few. The fields are white, but the laborers are few. Here's what he's saying. He said, look, for you to handle what you're going through, just add up what you've been through. He said, you, you fought it now, and you've had two bad weeks. He said, but just look at the 40 years that you went through nothing. <sighs> Somebody gonna hear me in a moment. He said, he said look, 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 you, you, you may be down now. He said, but do you remember I brought you for 40 years? That when others were down, you were sailing high. When others were doing well, you had no problems at all. He said, listen, it's just for a season. <sighs> He said, won't last but a few, few days. 
I, I, I said, now, now tell me how I need to deal with it. He said, look, through manifold, see the little word manifold. The man, word manifold actually means different colors. It means that temptation come upon you in different colors. In other words, temptation doesn't always come to us the same way all the time. Don't just come with pretty women and handsome men. Sometimes temptations show up with a, a quick way to make quick money. Sometimes temptations show up not physically, but mentally. Oh, you're not here. You see, mentally, temptation will work on you and start dealing with you with your mental capacity and will mess the rest of you up. It come in different... <sighs> Parisma in, in the Greek really mean to prove through a test. In other words, God said, look, I want to test your love to me. You've been telling me you love me. He said, let's see. <laughs> You've been telling everybody, oh, how I love Jesus and what he mean to me. You see, you can say that good when your icebox is full. Oh, you can talk about how I love him when you got a job making big money. You can talk about how much I love, but can you tell the Lord I love you at your mother's grave? Can you tell the Lord I love you with a pink slip in your hair? Can you tell the Lord I love you? Have I got a witness here? When they set all your furniture out on the street, come in here somebody. You said, can I get a witness? Well, come here, Abraham. Abraham, you've been talking about how much you love me? Let's see. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham's all right, Lord. He took Isaac to the mountain, took his knife, raised his knife, and was on his way down. And somehow God caught him in midair, said, hold it, Abraham. Oh, y'all not going to help me in this out. He said, now I know that you was willing to offer your only son. What are you saying in the text? This is what I'm saying. That God, he need to know that you need to know that you will sacrifice whatever you have for the cause of Christ. To the mountain. What are trials for? They do several things for us. Number one, they mature us. You will be real childish until you go through some trials. Mm -hmm. you, if you, you hadn't been through much, you just might miss church, lay around at the house, do nothing. You ain't been through it yet. When you, you hadn't gone through nothing, you have missed paying your tithes and laugh about it. <laughs> I just didn't pay, but didn't pay. If you hadn't been through nothing, you'd jump in the bed without talking to the Lord. If you hadn't been through anything, you'd laugh at other folk that's struggling. But when you've gone through it, you take everything serious. When you've gone through things, Ain't nothing funny about crisis. When you see somebody else struggling, then you hurt when they hurt because you've been where they are. Somebody ought to help me in this house. When you've been down, yeah, and nobody but God brought you up, you stop playing and start praising. You take every day serious, every moment become a precious moment to you because you know you didn't have to be where you are. Only God could have brought you to where you are now. Yeah, crisis mature us, but it also give us patience. Find a person that ain't got much patience, they ain't been through nothing. No, no, no. You ain't got no patience. You can't wait, can't wait. You got to have it right now, right now. Everything got to be instant. You don't get it now. You get upset. You get mad. Once you've gone through stuff, God will, he will teach you patience. Watch James 1 and 2. My brother and count it all joy. 
the word count come from a spreadsheet it's a, it's a it's a terminology that's used when they count you know accounting department they use the spreadsheet in other words they count your they count your liabilities over here they count your outgo over here and your income over here they put it on a spreadsheet that's what james said in james 1 and 2 he said look you need to have a spreadsheet count your good days over here and then count your bad days over here he said but now watch this he said don't deal with either of and go to shouting about your good days and try to ignore your bad days he said god sent the bad days to help you appreciate the good days Oh, somebody gonna help me this out. You see, every bad day to us is just a test in time. You see, God need to put your faith to a test. You see, if your faith can't be tested, it can't be trusted. It got to go through some stuff. And you ever notice that when you're in school and you fail the test, they send you back. That's what happened with God. When he send you to a test and you fail, he send you back. <laughs> Some people want to rush through it and get out of it. But can I tell you how you need to handle it? While you're going through your testing time, it's praying time. <laughs> While you're going through your difficult days, get closer to the Lord. <laughs> While you're going through your testing time spend a little more time on your knees spend a little more time reading your bible because you will understand god better if you know god more if you know him more you can deal with situations here's what you'll do while you're going through it instead of you panicking you know what you'll say father i stretch my hand to thee no other Yep, I know, Lord, I've tried everything else. I've tried all these other things. They all fail me. And I know I can depend on you. And listen, when you look at the Lord and what the Lord has done in our lives, you know he's not going to leave us where we are. Ephesians, Philippians, rather, 1 and 6, he that has begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, he started something in us, and he's not going to leave us halfway. <laughs> Are y'all here? <laughs> and listen to what he said. John 10 and 10, a thief coming not for but to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. In other words, I don't want you to just exist. I want you to have real life. <laughs> Psalms 23 verse 5, he said, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies in other words he will bless you in the midst of enemies in other words you have enemies all around you that say you wouldn't make it can't go no further Lord said look I'm in charge of this thing I'm gonna bless you right in their presence he said matter of fact I'll take your enemies and make a stool and use them to help you reach some stuff you couldn't reach without your enemies ain't that some God will take your enemies and use at your behalf and you look back and send through many dangers toys and snares I have already come and in James 1 and 2 said my brother encountered all joy when you fall into divers temptation he said the reason you can have joy watch verse 3 he said and knowing this you see when the reason you can have joy is because you know something <laughs> <laughs> oh, y'all don't hear me. Now. The reason some folk panic is because they don't know what's going to happen next. But when you know something, you know somebody. And when you know somebody, you know something. When you know something, you know somebody. Have I got a witness here? And there's somebody you know, help you know, that he won't leave you by yourself. You see, why are you going through it? <laughs> 
I, last time I took a physical, they put me on that machine to test my heart, and they had me just jogging to see how long I would last, but to put the, some kind of thing on my chest so they could keep up with my pus to see if I would hold out to make it through the, through the test. Well, God does us that way. Why are you going through it? He keep his finger on your pus. Somebody ought to help me in this house. And when, when it get to the point where you're exhausted and can't go no further, I, I, I said earlier today that I used to say that God won't put no more on you can bear, but he does. He put more on you than you can bear so he can bear it for you. Oh, Y'all ain't gonna hit me in this house. And when the load get where you can't handle it, he get underneath the load and carry the load for you. And, and when you get through, ain't only looking back and said, look at how I made it. It was not you that made it. It was the Lord that brought you to where you are here now. Have I got any help in this house? I don't want to get happy too fast in here. He said, but look, even though the temptation is there, watch verse 7. He said that the trying of your faith uh, being much more precious than gold. <laughs> oh, y'all don't hear me. He said, look, you think gold is precious, but it's not like your faith. Shout faith one time. It's not like faith. You see, God wants to test your faith. You see, number one, God furnishes the faith for us. And then he said, look, I need to put your faith in a test. Now watch he use faith as a comparison to gold. Now, the goldsmith, when he goes out, number one, he goes out and he finds a man. When he finds the man, he go out and get a sample of the gold. <laughs> then he bring the sample back to, yeah, to his testing shop. And he put it under his microscope to see if the ore has any sign of gold. Once he discover that's some gold in there, then he go back and he buy the whole gold mine. Y'all don't hear me. Then he take the gold and put the gold in a smelting pot. Yeah. But now, there's a lot of grease and grime that's got the gold covered. So what does he do? He put the gold in a pot. And he put fire, yeah, up under the pot. And occasionally, he get up out of his chair, he go look in the smithing pot and see he can see the reflection of his face when he cannot see his face in the pot oh lord he go back uh, sit down and let the, the fire keep working on the gold then he go back again after several hours looking the pot to see if he can see the reflection of his face if he cannot see it he take his time go back sit down and wait on how long the goal to cook a little more and then he go back and look at the pot again and when he can see his face in the goal he know then it's pure gold. Have I got a witness here? Well, God take you, 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 and you, and put you in a spiritual smithing pot. And he's 
turn the fire of disappointment up. Mm, yeah, he turned the fire of brokenheartedness up. He turned the fire of hardship up in the panda. And every now and then he looked in the panda to see if he can see his reflection in your life. Hold on. And when he cannot see it, you know what he does. He turns free from rain. The fire up a little hotter. And when he cannot see his face, he turned the fire up higher and higher. Hold on. And when he can finally see his face in the pot, he know then that the gold your soul is pure. Have I got a witness him? But that's what he says in the text. He said it is more precious, yeah, than gold, yeah, though it be tried by fire. Now watch what he said at the end of verse 7. I'll say verse 8 and 9 till the night. But watch what he said. He said, he said, might be found on the praises and on the that's enough right there. This is what he said, that, that when God gets through with me, I show a praise in him. When God take me through my dark days, I learn how to give him glory. Oh, that's why I don't bother folk that have gone through stuff because you don't know what God brought them through. Have I got a witness here? I used to be like some of y'all. Uh, I used to laugh when folk would shout uh, and go on in church uh, because I didn't understand uh, what they had been through. Uh, yeah, but you can't tell me if a person been on that deathbed and God brought them through uh, that they can't praise him. Have I got a witness? You cannot tell me if a man been laid off for six months living from kin to kent and God finally opened my door for him and he's now able to feed his own family that he can't praise God. You can't tell me that somebody been strung out on drugs going to rehab after rehab and finally God slapped the taste out of their mouth uh, and now they ain't got no more taste uh, to have drugs and wine uh, it just looked like to me uh, that's time to praise the Lord uh, y'all got to excuse me now uh, my boss man is here now uh, yeah uh, I got so much uh, to praise my God for I said I got so much uh, to praise God for I can't uh, act like you act uh, and if you want to know something about me uh, better ask me uh, because can't nobody tell you uh, like I can uh, what God uh, has done for me uh, can I say it one more time uh, can't nobody uh, tell you like I can uh, what my God has done for me uh, I'm reminded of an old sister that shouted every Sunday, got on everybody's nerve. Nobody wanted to see her come. She would shout doing devotion. She would shout while the choir was singing, shout while the deacons was praying, and shouting all through the sermon. And one day, two sisters caught her in the grocery store and said, ma'am, ain't you that lady that shout all the time? She said, I do get kind of emotional. They said, no, ma'am, you shout every Sunday. Tell us your story. 
why do you shout so much? Uh, she said, well, and, uh, I was married to a good man uh, that wanted me to be a good housewife. Uh, she just wanted me to be the queen uh, when the king would come home. Uh, I had five little boys. Uh, I had no career. I had no trade nor skill. Uh, and one night, uh, he laid down and died. And I had no money saved up. I had no insurance on him. I had no way to take care of my boys. But as God would have it, I was able to raise all five. I sent all boys through school. They all got degrees. Have I got a witness here? My oldest boy is a doctor. The one right under him is an attorney. My third boy is an engineer. Fourth boy is an accountant. My fifth boy was just elected to public office. She said, let me tell you about my boys. They all got together and bought mama a house. She said, let me tell you about my house. I got wall-to-wall -wall carpet. I got one of them built-in stove. A built-in refrigerator. I got one of them microwave ovens. I got inside bathrooms. And see that little red car that's sitting in front of the store? My boys bought that for their mama. And this grocery that I'm putting in this in this thing uh, I don't have to pay a quarter my boys uh, buys it for me one get it this week uh, another get it next week uh, another one the next uh, another one the next uh, and when they get through uh, they start all over again she said y'all ask me uh, why I shout so much uh, she said I got so much uh, the Thank God for, have I got two witnesses in here? Anybody like that woman? Uh, turn around and shake somebody's hand. Say, I got so much uh, to thank God for. So much. Uh, yes, sir. So much. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so much. Uh, to thank